Good afternoon again, everyone. And on our panel today, we have uh, um, everyone here has a doctorate, which is amazing and brilliant. And Saman, who's with us, she's recently finished her postdoc at University College London's Knowledge Lab, and she's now working at the Raspberry Pi Foundation and their research centre at Cambridge University as a research scientist where she's exploring ways to teach AI in schools. And we've got Garen with us and he's a Bill and Melinda Gates postdoctoral associate in the Teaching Systems Lab in MIT. And he leads work on an open source simulation based research and development platform known as DEX. And the rest of the panel are the three professors. Sorry, they're not the three tenors, but I know that Eileen has a very good singing voice. And um, she's our Regis professor, very prestigious post here in the university. We've got Regina, lovely to have Regina here. She's played an important role in this program as she was um, Associate Dean for Research in Wales. And of course, we've got Bart here. And Bart has been a real driving force in this program of work. So thank you for that, Bart. What I'd like to do now is start um, with a question, which is for the three professors. So um, there were three major themes evolved from this project, and that was with learners and the power of language, innovative technologies, educators and inclusive practice. And I'd like to um, you to um, tell us about what you think the major take home messages for the academy are from these three strands. And um, and especially since the work focused around multidisciplinary teams. So I'm going to put Bart in the hot seat first, then Eileen and then Regine. So please take over the three professors. Wow! <laughs> no pressure, Denise. I think <laughs> the, the one thing we've learned across the 19 ch chapters is that one size does not fit all. In all the chapters, that's become really clear that what may work for one group of, let's say, English learners learning a language does not work for French learners in uh, another country. And I think what is, for example, really powerful by, for example, the work that Saman has done is whatever we design from a UK perspective may work for our UK learners, but it definitely won't necessarily work for learners, for example, in China or learners who have accessibility needs as uh, Paco has shown. So these are my one size doesn't fit all. Thank you, Bart. Over to Eileen. Sorry about that, I couldn't get my mic to unmute. Um, I've been really interested in chaining the little breakout group that I had, uh, and that slightly changed the nature of what I was going to say. I was inspired by the person this morning who said that we need to look at these uh, doctoral scholars and recognise both their ambition and bravery in the way that they approach the work. And that came very strongly to me uh, from listening to the four presentations that I had in my section. Um, in terms of technology, I think not so much conversations about technology, many more conversations about what still needed to be done to make open world learning truly accessible and effective and, for example, able to cope with the global uh, disparity that Saman picked up uh, from her work. The approach that uh, Garon take, took to understanding the different community perspectives even on things like classifiers of emotions that needed to be looked at. Um, accessibility in general, I mean, I think the work that Paco uh, talked to us about in the break, um, 
says we have done lots of work on accessibility. We've raised lots of um, issues and concerns and developed methods, but there's still tons to be done. Um, and finally, the uh, contribution that we had by video, very nice video from Juan. Um, he talked to us in quite a lot of detail about trying to unpack uh, learning design, student engagement, learning analytics and student achievement. And I think what comes to me most strongly from the body of work that I was reminded of this uh, this afternoon and these particular presentations, but is very well represented across the book, is the ambition behind the programme to make things better for everyone in open world learning and a recognition that we've made some good steps along the way, but there's still tons of work to be done. And I see that in the careers of the doctoral scholars who've left us. They each of the presentations I heard was relying on the interesting methods that they've developed, uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, actually groundbreaking methods that have been developed to study these complex issues. And I'm so delighted to see that, particularly for the people who returned to us today, um, that I, I can only predict a really uh, important future in developing the idea of open world learning going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. And now over to Ricky. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, sort of following on for that. Um, so from my point of view, the take home message or the key take home message is the impact that the new technologies are having on uh, learning and on teaching and the implications of this for educators today. Uh, so I think over the past years, we've really been witnessing the development of new learning ecologies, uh, which really have the potential to be more inclusive than what we're used to uh, in our sort of traditional learning and teaching parameters. Um, educators can really make use of today's technologies to make learning more exciting and also more relevant. I think that's really important. Um, they can use it to uh, bring the world into the classroom and at the same time move education out into the wild. So I think that's, um, that's a sort of a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. However, they do need the kind of skills um, to, to do that, uh, that many, I think, currently don't really have. So I think that's sort of one of the issues. But I think if you look at the studies um, done by our PhD students, which, which are sort of really amazing, um, you'll see how very many really focus on different tools and technologies that are providing examples for this sort of change of how we learn and teach languages uh, and and other other subjects um, so i think uh, really it's been great to sort of read the the various um, chapters the, the sort of work that they have done and also uh, to hear today um, about about their work thank you thank you so much um a wonderful summary there and I think a great taster and an invitation for people to actually go away and read this important work. Now I'd like to ask Saman and Garon to answer some questions. Do you think you could put your cameras on? That's... There's Garon. Is Saman with us? Yeah, I am. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, there she is. So really, uh, we'll start with Sana and then we'll move on to Garong. And um, I've really got two questions for you both. And one is what surprised you most about the topic you were researching. And secondly, you know, if you were given unlimited funding now, your fairy godmother suddenly appeared. What research 
uh, would you like to do to take forward now that you think is going to really make a difference? So if we start with Summer and then we'll move on to Garrel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That's very interesting. <laughs> I would absolutely love to meet this fairy godmother. Yeah. So what surprised, uh, yeah, what was the most surprising part? To give you some context, in my research, I was trying to explore how online learners learn from uh, those who are from different geocultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. How do they engage with different types of learning design elements or different types of learning activities? So for example, instructional videos, reading material, or discussion-based learning activities or quizzes. And when I started working on this project, my surprise, it had three parts, if you allow me. Yeah, so first was how much data is available there. It's, it's just literally sitting there from millions of users who got enrolled in one or the other mode. And second, how supportive the research community is. So, in, in this particular context. So for example, we, we made some strong collaborations with researchers working at, for example, at Stanford or at Cornell. So they were super supportive. Obviously the data is not exactly residing there. You will have to sign an MOU, which we did, but they are super supportive. And third part of my surprise, despite the availability of this voluminous data and this amazing, amazingly supportive research community, how limited research has been done in this domain. So that, that was the surprise. And sorry, what was your second question? Uh, yeah, so funding. Yeah. <laughs> so I've already talked about this mouth watering amount of data, which is residing there. But that was this, that research was conducted in a pre-COVID world. And uh, revisiting my research in a post-COVID world could not be more timely. And the implications and lessons that we learn from this research will appear more relevant if a replication or for example, extension is performed. And for that, I have two linked thread in mind. First, and imagine how, how amazing it would be if we perform an extension or replication in a context other than MOOCs. So for example, in hybrid or in face-to-face -face learning environment. And that's something that higher education all around the world has come to rely on in post-COVID world. And the second, even more useful uh, dimension would be a design-based research where we, we use the lessons that we learn from this research and we implement them and we design MOOCs uh, following the guidelines or following the, the recommendations from my research. And then we start a cycle. We analyze data from the, from the newly designed MOOCs and see what we can do about, about it, if it makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And it, it sort of points away to things we're thinking about in IT and at the year you're about open research and open data and sharing. So we've got scalability and we can see across the world what's happened. I think you're absolutely right. And I I hope you can get your funding. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Thank not going to leave this. <laughs> Daryl. Can I move to you now, please? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Denise. Um, not exactly the prompt, but first I just want to express gratitude for all of the fantastic uh, learning that took place within this program and how it's planted so many seeds that have really generated a lot of really interesting work post uh, PhD and in my postdoc. But with that said, the first thing I'd like to say is one of the things that was really surprising in my work was all of the um, work that I did in, again, interviews. If you're doing quantitative research, find a way to do an interview because you're going to find some of the most gems of surprises there. Uh, and in one of the interviews that I conducted, I showed predictions of a classifier of emotional expression to people about their own communication. 
and I asked them if the prediction changed their mind about what they thought about their own communication. And um, what I was trying to understand was that if we built a classifier that represented some form of a consensus from the community, um, built on the perspectives of the community, would that sort of help people work toward a consensus? And there was places where I saw what I was sort of anticipating, which was I'd show someone like 20 or 30 of their own messages, and they'd change their mind about one or two things. And they'd be like, oh, I can kind of see what, what's going on there, and that kind of makes sense to me. That was fully anticipated. What was surprising was one of the interviews that I conducted, someone changed their mind 22 or 20 times, out of like about half of their communication, they changed their mind to agree with what the algorithm's prediction was. And I was concerned about that. Um, I was concerned about how much people might just um, acquiesce to the opinion of an algorithm um, and not really be learning from it, but just sort of saying, oh, it must be right. Um, and I think that that raises some really interesting concerns around fairness, transparency, accountability, algorithmic designs uh, that we really need to start thinking about uh, as we start moving in towards uh, adoptions of AI within learning environments, that, uh, that sometimes those predictions might just actually become self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, and so we have to be careful about what we're predicting, how we're sharing, and how we're supporting people to interpret those predictions. Um, I think that that's going to be a really interesting challenge coming. Um, and if I had um, a, a magic pot of money uh, to work with, uh, I think that the the thing that I'm I'm I'll say is that one of the seeds that was planted in this program was when uh, Rebecca Ferguson invited me to contribute to the Innovating Pedagogy report, where I got to write a report on decolonizing learning. And um, and I see that and in an intersection of that style of work with sort of community driven uh, machine learning classifier work as a way of framing and thinking about how I'm working on the platform decks that I'm working on right now, where I let communities create their own simulations about difficult social interactions, um, where often there's some sort of a power dynamic like a teacher and a student or a a police officer and an incarcerated youth. Like there's a variety of, of situations where these difficult social interactions take place. And then thinking really deeply about like who is participating in establishing what the classifiers consider to be truth. Um, and so you can imagine that when there's these interesting power dynamics at play and these different perspectives, the, the student perspective, the teacher perspective, um, I think that that was, was something that um, I, I'm thinking about this work that I'm doing from like a scale from the start, totally informed by the four P's of the open world learning uh, research agenda and, and trying to think about how do we include communities in the process of creating algorithms um, that are making interpretations about social interactions? And how do we get people to learn both where those algorithms can be beneficial and where it might shape one or two of your opinions um, and also with a sufficient level of sophisticated understanding so that you don't just agree with every prediction that's shown to you. Um, and so I feel like that's a challenge where, where if we want to benefit um, from, from some of these innovative technologies, we need to help build some level of sophistication in sort of the consumption of those technologies. And, and the strategy that I employ in doing that work is by empowering communities and shifting power to communities to be participants and sort of community-centered research and development around both the materials that are being used as well as the measures that are being um, used to make predictions about what's said within a simulated difficult social interaction. Um, so, Thank you, yeah. Daryl. In fact, you've answered the next question <laughs> that I wanted to pose to everyone, so thank you. And so we'll have all the panel back on board and Garen has actually given us the um, answer to the next question, which I'd like to ask you all to address, which is what is the grand challenge now for open learning? Um, I can see Eileen and I can see Bart on screen. Then we'll go to Samar and then we'll go to Regina. So uh, take it away, Eileen. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, th I, th I think from what I've been hearing today um, that the grand challenge is to properly unpack what is meant by accessibility to learning 
I think we've, you know, uh, we've talked about providing access and we've talked about uh, learning design and we've talked uh, about um, student engagement, attitudes, all sorts of things. Um, but across all that, we, uh, you know, with this is the 10th year of the MOOC this year um, since uh, the the first of the X MOOCs uh, was launched from Stanford. And I think that the, if you like, the, the, uh, the, the hope that was behind some of that activity that by providing free access to materials, all problems in education and society would be solved. It's obviously that hasn't happened. What, what has happened is there's more access to more open material and the challenge that we have as educators is trying to make sense of the research, quite a lot of research that's been done in the past 10 years to, to further, um, uh, oh, I don't want to say level the playing field, that has terrible connotations, but further make um, the kind of inroads into inequalities in education, further develop work that helps uh, the remove the barriers to learning across the globe. Just a small one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. That will keep us going a long time. <laughs> right, off we go. So if I go next, if I take a, a, a dark perspective, I mean, I think over the last five years, what we have seen is that the role of experts and the role of knowledge has been really heavily criticized. And, you know, if you now say, oh, I'm an expert in this, then there will always be someone who will find, well, who, who, is, who is it that you're saying that you're the expert? And I hopefully can trust my doctor, for example. But there are lots of people who don't seem to trust the knowledge that is out there on the web. So I think from a dark perspective, open world learning has opened a fantastic can of worms that you can find your truth anywhere online. If I take a positive perspective, I think what we need to do is to how uh, to find out mechanisms and ways how we can effectively train the next generation of educators, researchers and learners to make sense of this so that they can really try to understand the powers of open world learning, but also be critical if something is stated on the Internet that may or may not be necessarily true. So I'm handing the wands to Regina. Thank you. Yes, and I actually want to talk from my position as a language educator and sort of shift things a little bit, um, because I think um, there are a number of studies included in the book um, that focus on language uh, learning and teaching. And I think that's really, really good, because if we look at the situation in the UK, there is a really worrying decline um, in the take up of languages. And I think you are all aware of that. So many adults in the UK only speak English um, unless they have a migration background and so possibly have uh, access to another language. And so there are lots of people who have little access to the sort of benefits um, that exposure to a second language can bring, and those are cognitive, uh, affective, social and economic benefits. And I think Brexit, to sort of bring that in as well, hasn't helped. Um, the UK's international focus is really shrinking, and all of this results in a quite a worrying narrowing of people's attitudes and intercultural understanding. And I think that links a bit uh, to what uh, has just been said. And there's also a narrowing of opportunities. So for me, the sort of challenge really lies in encouraging people, oh, I don't know, probably especially politicians and educationalists to actually make a push for languages um, and just make sure that the importance um, of being able to speak a second language or several second languages is recognised. So that's my my sort of pitch. 
Thank you so much. Very valuable insight, <laughs> Regina. And uh, Sama, would you like to uh, close this question now, please? Yes, yeah, so grand challenge for open learning. So in, in my opinion, and I, I might be wrong, obviously, sustainability, but that's not new. So the challenge, this challenge was always there. And one of our liver Hume fellows, actually, Dr. Kwan Nguyen has done some amazing work on this. So students engagement in open learning environment making open and accessible learning resources is one thing and keeping the learners engaged with those resources is another thing so yeah sustainability keeping them afloat readily available and engageable in my opinion is still a challenge <laughs> thank you i want to close the question with a quick fire um uh, answer and um, we'll go in the order that we had just now. So we'll start with Eileen. So I want you in two, three words now so that we can leave the um, our visitors, our participants with um, some key words, let's say, re reverberating in their ears about what building on what we've got here and we've done. Um, what areas of research should be funded going forward now? Eileen, if you'd start, please. Thank you. I'm going to steal Bart's. I'm going to say re uh, capturing truth and reason in the open world learning community. Thank you, Eileen. I have the privilege of going first. <laughs> have a quick rethink, Bart. <laughs> Um, I'm going for unique learning trajectories. Thank you. Regina? OK, and I'm going for today's digital transformation, uh, especially in education and a pedagogy of multiliteracies. Thank you. Then to Summer and then to uh, Garon. Yeah, I'll go for innovation and sustainability. Let's go innovative. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll have the final word with uh, we should be focusing on uh, community driven learning. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being such good sports, a very interesting panel. And also, not only that, really thinking about these big issues which we all need to be addressing and especially in the OU now with our big focus on societal challenge. But thank you all so much. It's been such an enjoyable afternoon. And I'd like to ask you all to um, uh, show our appreciation for our panel. And I'd like to hand over to Bart now to close the afternoon. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much to all the panel members and the amazing chairing by uh, Denise. And thank you for attending this uh, this event. We've seen people from across the globe again attending, and we know that lots of people, because of the limitation of time zones, we are currently at nearly three o'clock UK time, which is not very convenient for our friends, for example, in Australia to join. But I know that they will watch the recording. So thank you also for those who are watching this um, afterwards. Also, I'm really grateful for all the Levium students that were here today, but also who were unable to make it because of time zone issues and the 30 plus supervisors have done a fantastic work. Um, and I also would like to in particular thank um, James, Michelle and Christina for the amazing support in making this, um, uh, this event uh, possible. Of course, I would like to be very grateful to Levium uh, sponsoring 15 out of the 18 students. And I also am very, very grateful for the three sponsored uh, students by the Open University. Uh, again, the book is available from now on uh, or it's today. And if you are interested in the work we're doing, we will keep posting all our amazing work on our website, iit.open.ac.uk. So thank you so much for um, joining. And um, well, see you somewhere on this open planet. Bye for now.